This is a man who's influenced more people and educated more people about glutathione than anybody else on the planet. So it's a, it's an honor and a privilege to have us have you join us tonight, Dr. Gutman. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for the great uh, introduction. And and certainly it is very timely for tonight's topic. That can only mean one thing. Uh, people are going to start uh, sniffling and sneezing and, and coughing uh, if you haven't already. So as we mentioned, we, we are entering another cold flu season. Uh, and there's so many things uh, that are offered to you all to to take for a cold and take for a flu. And uh, um, uh, there's vaccinations being developed, uh, but we won't have time to deal with all of these today. And uh, certainly a lot of them are controversial. So, so let's focus on the role that glutathione specifically plays here. And we're also going to look at COVID and coronavirus because uh, both of these are, are relevant to our discussion. Uh, let's start off by looking at what these viruses are notorious for. Uh, certainly many of these viruses can go on to bronchitis or pneumonia or, or even overwhelming infections uh, and even death. But for the most part, they cause what is called a URTI, an upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, this is the shorthand that uh, uh, medical professionals use for this. Um, the upper respiratory tract, uh, URT, uh, involves the throat, the nose, the sinuses, the ears, uh, the trachea. And so as you would expect, the symptoms mostly relate to those areas, a sore or scratchy throat or runny nose, a cough, and so on. And the systemic infection can cause aches and pains, a headache, fatigue, uh, chills, a fever. Uh, you all have experienced this many times in your life. In fact, on average, um, most adults will suffer an upper, upper respiratory tract infection um, two to four times every year. Uh, kids, on the other hand, uh, can suffer many times more frequently than that, about six to eight times a, a year on average. Now, many of you may have noticed something odd in the last year or two, that you've caught the cold less often in the last couple of years than you did before. This is not a coincidence. It's because all of the precautions that we've taken against COVID-19, distancing ourselves, uh, idly isolating ourselves when we're sick, uh, we use masks, uh, our hygiene is better. Uh, this has actually caused a decrease in the frequency of getting sick for most of these viruses. But over the years, catching the cold or the flu has easily been one of the most common causes for having to visit a doctor. And not that the doctor can do much for you, but we still get a lot of calls, many, many calls for people with a cold. So these respiratory tract infections usually remain just a nuisance for us. <laughs> We're sick for a few days or two weeks would be a long time. Uh, we, we miss some work or we miss some school and then we're okay again. Now, some scientists believe that catching the odd cold is actually a good thing. It gives your immune system a workout, a chance to exercise and keep in shape. But occasionally, we can get much sicker and develop a bronchitis or a pneumonia as the infection spreads down into the lower respiratory system. Then the possibility of a bacterial infection on top of the viral infection can occur. And this uh, uh, requires the use of antibiotics. Now, antibiotics don't work on viruses, but they're used when, when you get what we call a super infection, not a super infection, but super as it on top of, you get a bacterial infection on top of the viral infection. And sometimes, some of these viruses can spread systemically and cause a whole body involvement and occasionally death. Um, this is rare for the common cold, very rare, but less rare for the flu and for sure all too common 
uh, with COVID-19. The main tool that we have against these viral infections is prevention. Uh, here you see a short list of some of the tips that you'll see posted everywhere, uh, hand washing, covering your mouth, uh, uh, putting your uh, hand over your face when you're sneezing or coughing, staying home when you're sick, and so on. And uh, like we mentioned earlier, we've shown how effective this can be from preventing a cold during the past couple of years while we held on to these practices during COVID. So what about glutathione and viruses? Let's take a look at that. This is a big topic. And if you want to take a deeper dive into this topic, I've got several videos that you can explore. All on my YouTube channel. Uh, you can see the, the uh, address here on the screen. And I welcome you all to visit. Uh, besides the discussion on glutathione and viruses and the immune system and COVID-19, there are many, many other glutathione-related videos that should interest you. Okay, now let me summarize what hundreds of studies have already shown. Glutathione is an antiviral agent. This is clear. Let me say it again. Glutathione is an antiviral substance. If you look at some of the immunocal studies, for example, you'll find articles on AIDS, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and more. And the reasons for glutathione to act as an antiviral are many. Here are just a few. Uh, viruses require an oxidative environment to thrive. In other words, free radicals promote viral replication. Glutathione augments the activity of both the innate immune response and adaptive immunity. Glutathione raises the activity of T cells and natural killer cells. Glutathione modulates cytokine activity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many factors that we can talk about how glutathione functions as an antiviral agent. So let's take a look at the common cold. Uh, this is actually not just a single virus. There are actually over 200 subtypes of the common cold. And this is why we never become immune to catching a cold. There are just too many types, and each type is capable of mutating into a, a slightly different type. And this is why the development of a cold vaccine has never taken place successfully. Just taking a look at some of the more common viruses causing the common cold. The most common one causing a common cold is a rhinovirus. Rhino means nose, by the way. So a runny nose is the most common symptom. Uh, depending on the year and the location, rhinoviruses can cause between 30 and 80% of colds in a given year, uh, usually mild and self-limiting. You may not be aware of this, but we've all suffered from a coronavirus infection probably many times in our lifetime. It's the second most common cause of the common cold. There are many subtypes of coronavirus, somewhere between three and seven, which cause an upper respiratory tract infection in humans. Again, these are very common and usually a mild illness that you can get over in a few days. COVID-19 is a coronavirus, but one that is mutated into a much more virulent form. How this happened, um, we won't get into that in tonight's discussion. The influenza virus is also pretty common, about 10 or 15% of upper respiratory tract infections. Many people catch the flu, but are not that sick, sometimes not sick at all, which increases the possibility of spreading it. Uh, however, many people do get awfully miserable with the flu, far worse than a rhinovirus virus, and often end up in bed for a week or two. Uh, the influenza virus, or the flu, uh, carries a much higher risk of going on to become a pneumonia. And it's a particular risk uh, to the elderly, uh, the sick, and the immunocompromised. It actually causes 
thousands of deaths each year. Uh, adenovirus is a, another relatively common virus. Again, usually not that severe. Uh, often it appears as a conjunctivitis or, or pink eye. And then there are a bunch more that we could find in our population. RSV or respiratory syncytial virus seems to be becoming uh, increasingly prevalent. So lots of possibilities, lots of threats. And this chart just lists a few. Like we mentioned, there are over 200 subtypes of the cold. Again, I remind you that coronavirus is one of the more common causes of a cold, usually mild and easy to fight off without medication. Uh, COVID-19, again, is different. Uh, we've not uh, been exposed to this mutation until 2019, and so our immune systems were poorly equipped to deal with this variant, which made it so much of a problem. Now, let's focus a little bit more on rhinovirus, the most common one, and look at some studies done investigating the role of glutathione here. Now, in this study, researchers looked at the receptors on airway tissues to which the rhinovirus it uses to attach to the cells uh, in your nose and your throat. Uh, it was previously suspected that oxidative stress was in part responsible for upregulating these recept receptors to attract more viral particles. So they investigated the use of antioxidants to suppress the action. Um, if you're reading the title, uh, reducing agent, by the way, is uh, what uh, chemists call an antioxidant. So it's antioxidants inhibit rhinovirus-induced upregulation of the receptor. So, of course, the antioxidant they used is glutathione, the master antioxidant. They used that as their weapon. And as predicted, raising glutathione successfully inhibited the attraction and stickiness of these receptors. So and they concluded that raising glutathione should be considered as a potential treatment for rhinovirus. Uh, in this Italian study, now, scientists wondered whether decreased glutathione levels correlated with increased inflammation and oxidative stress in the affected cells. And again, as expected, they found that the rhinovirus both increased oxidative stress and lowered glutathione levels, and treatment with glutathione reversed both of these and ultimately decreased inflammation. So raising glutathione in rhinovirus holds a lot of potential. Let's look at another virus that seems to be making the news these days, RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, you probably heard about it on the news. Uh, this seems to be accounting for more and more respiratory illnesses these days. So there's a lot of evidence that, for example, asthma is mediated by oxidative stress and that viral infection, which is associated with asthma onset and exacerbation, acts as a type of oxidative stress. The goal in this study was to determine whether RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, induces oxidative stress in human airway epithelial cells and whether it's this RSV-induced oxidative stress that could induce airway inflammation. And not only did they find that this was in fact true, but they also demonstrated that raising glutathione levels reversed all of this. Very promising. A, a Spanish team also looked at glutathione levels in RSV and found that by using glutathione levels, they could predict the severity of infection by the amount of glutathione deficiency. In other words, glutathione levels were inversely correlated with the degree of infection.
Here, doctors uh, used a glutathione precursor uh, called NAC, and many of you have heard of that, to raise glutathione levels. And they showed that with increased glutathione, cells showed less inflammation, less mucus production, uh, lowered certain inflammatory cytokines, and served as an antiviral. Very convincing. What about glutathione and the flu or the influenza? Uh, still a big threat, despite all of our focus on COVID-19. The flu is uh, still much more common. Uh, let's first look at this article from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, where I was chief resident of emergency medicine many years ago. Uh, what they did was look at both tissue cultures and living organisms to test whether raising glutathione would suppress the flu's progression. And looking at tissue cultures, including human lung epithelial cells, glutathione significantly inhibited the production of active influenza viruses. In live animals, glutathione decreased the viral count in the lung and tracheal tissues. Together, the data suggests that glutathione has anti-influenza activity, both in the lab and in animals. Now, this graph here shows that as glutathione concentration was raised, the viral load simultaneously dropped. This study here was one of the first articles looking at raising glutathione levels in influenza and remains my favorite. It goes back uh, to the 1990s. Uh, led by Dr. Sylvain de Flora, the team put human subjects on NAC, which raised glutathione, for six months during the peak of the flu season. And they were compared to a group who were simultaneously taking a placebo. So this was a placebo-controlled study. And the participants kept a daily log of their health symptoms, you know, how sick they were, what their symptoms were, and were also tested for flu antibodies. So let's look at some of these findings. In this chart, the placebo group are represented by the lavender bars and the glutathione precursors by the deep purple bars. And what we're looking at are the symptoms reported by the patients. For example, a cough or a sore throat or a runny nose. You can see from the chart that the glutathione group had anywhere from one half to one third of the symptoms compared to placebo. And they also looked at who were sick enough to be bedridden. Of the 10 patients who suffered from the flu who were not bedridden, okay? In other words, they had the flu, they didn't have to go to bed. Out of 10 of those, nine of them were receiving the NAC treatment to raise glutathione, nine out of 10. This chart is even more revealing. It was based on whether the patient had a positive blood test for having the flu and whether they had symptoms or not. So we're looking whether they had a positive test and whether they had symptoms. A full 80% of the people not taking the placebo who had a positive test had clear-cut symptoms. 80% of those without glutathione levels elevated had symptoms. On the other hand, the group with enhanced glutathione levels, only 25% developed symptoms. So let me repeat this. In the patients that were raising glutathione levels that had a positive result for having the influenza virus, only a quarter of them ended up showing symptoms. This is a major, major reduction uh, um, in the likelihood of being sick if you catch the flu. So those with elevated glutathione had decreased symptoms, decreased severity of symptoms, and a shorter course to recovery. This is just a, a, a really, really outstanding study. Finally, let's take a look at COVID-19. Now, I know it seems odd that we would compare COVID-19 to the flu and the common cold, but in reality, 
most cases of COVID these days just look and feel like a bad cold. And hopefully things will stay that way. I do need to remind you that um, I've covered this topic extensively and you can find presentations on this by visiting my YouTube channel uh, posted here. Uh, there's a detailed presentation on glutathione and COVID-19, um, and you could link to it using the address on the screen, so uh, please visit it. Let me just say that this is an area that's been extensively investigated and continues to be a focus of research. When you go to pubmed.gov and enter the search terms glutathione and COVID, you'll get back a whopping 250 articles, all written within the last three years, and many more, uh, by the way, on the way. Uh, the relationship between glutathione and COVID-19 is very well established. Let's look at some of the findings. Low glutathione is a risk factor for developing COVID. People with higher levels of glutathione are less likely to get sick with COVID-19. Low glutathione levels correlate with the severity of COVID. In other words, the lower your glutathione levels are, the greater the severity of the illness. And just like other viral infections, COVID itself depletes glutathione. This may lead to a downward spiral of illness. Low glutathione increases lung inflammation. The levels of glutathione are inversely correlated with the degree of lung damage and inflammation. And much of this damage and inflammation in the lung is caused by the production of molecules we call inflammatory cytokines. You've heard of a cytokine storm. These are mediated by specific immune cells and are meant to kill off the viruses, but when they're uncontrolled, they can also kill off lung tissue. Low glutathione increases the risk of cytokine storm. You could learn more about this in my other videos. Three existing conditions for severe COVID-19 are all linked to glutathione levels. Uh, uh, what are some of the pre-existing conditions that put a patient at risk for severe COVID illness, for intubation, for death? Well, old age, diabetes, smokers, lung disease. What do all of these pre-existing conditions have in common? They're all diseases that suffer from glutathione depletion. And most importantly, glutathione precursors have been successfully used in clinical trials. And as you know, this remains the most important aspect. And, and there are trials that have demonstrated that a particularly, uh, have there been studies that show this in human beings? Well, in this case, yes, absolutely. And more trials are underway. Uh, again, just go to PubMed and look at glutathione and COVID and look at the amount of existing research that already exists. So taking this all into account, I believe that given the negligible downside of raising glutathione and the huge potential upside should make this choice a no-brainer. And if we look at the things that we're supposed to be doing for prevention, hand masking, hand washing, uh, uh, wearing a mask, uh, cleaning, et cetera, et cetera, there's one other item uh, to add to this list. Raise your glutathione levels. So thank you very much for your uh, attention.